Hello, I'm Morgan Jorgensen, the Donor Relations and Events Manager for the Truman Library Institute. Welcome to The Cold War Gets Hot, The Truman Doctrine and Democracy's Challenge, Then and Now, the latest installment in our 75th anniversary programming. Tonight, we're joined by John Avlon, Senior Political Analyst at CNN, discussing Truman's actions 75 years ago and their relevance to the events of today. But first, we'll hear from Clifton Truman Daniel, eldest grandson of President Truman, author and honorary chairman of the Truman Library Institute Board. At the conclusion of the presentation, there will be a 10 to 15 minute Q&A session. Questions can be submitted during and immediately following the remarks via the Q&A feature at the bottom of your screen. Without further ado, I'll hand the program over to Clifton Truman Daniel. Clifton, take it away. Thank you, Morgan. And thank you, John, for joining us. Thank you, ladies and gentlemen out there also for joining us. Uh, in addition to being senior political analyst, analyst and anchor at CNN, uh, John appears on New Day every morning. From 2013 to 2018, he was editor in chief and managing director of the Daily Beast. During his tenure, they won 17 journalism awards and increased the daily readership to more than a million people. Uh, John is the author of Independent Nation, Wingnuts, Washington's Farewell, and Just Out, Lincoln and Fight for Peace. He is co-editor of the acclaimed Deadline Arts Journalism Anthologies, and in 2012, he won the National Society of Newspaper Columnists Award for Best Online Column. John is uh, possibly the sanest person that I know, uh, a voice of reason in the midst of the chaos that we call our political discourse today. Uh, I know him to personally be able to single-handedly manage a group of presidential descendants, unruly presidential descendants, including his own wife, firing lines Margaret Hoover. And he has the uncanny ability to be able to find an open bar stool at Sloppy Joe's, Ernest Hemingway's favorite haunt in Key West. Ladies and gentlemen, John Avalon. Thank you very much, Clifton. Uh, it is an honor uh, to be asked to speak here to mark the 75th anniversary of the Truman Doctrine. Um, a speech and a policy and a set of principles uh, whose importance I don't think can be overstated, but whom I think we all appreciate with the current events around the world. Uh, its wisdom and its relevance today is perhaps now more than ever. Harry Truman spoke to Congress on March 12th, 1947 at a hinge of history. And his speech was much more than I think just the start of the Cold War, as it's sometimes discussed. It, it was that, but of course it was so much more because it was a final determination that the United States would accept a mantle of leadership in the world, not on behalf of itself, but on behalf of free people and democracies everywhere. That it was a statement of democracy standing up to autocracies, in this case, the Soviet Union. Um, but it also distanced America definitively from a policy of isolationism, which had dominated uh, American politics, at first through the mere fact of, of our isolation from the rest of the world, courtesy of two oceans. Um, but after the Second World War, an understanding that there needed to be an investment in peace, that multilateral organizations need to be, needed to be created, as was done so effectively under the Truman administration, to bolster liberal democracy and a new order based on the idea that small nations would not be at the mercy of big ones, that there was a, such a thing as human dignity and self-determination, and that the United States and its allies had an important role to play, not in encouraging confrontation, but to standing up for aggression. Uh, and that's where I think today, with Vladimir Putin's invasion of Ukraine, vicious and unprovoked, we realize that the past is not past, that history is something that takes place in the here and now, and we all contribute to making it. And there are certain principles, certain presidents, certain moments that we draw on for inspiration, and that Harry Truman's stewardship of the post-war world in the wake of the Second World War, his establishment of certain principles, uh, remains core to America's identity, 
and indeed to the hopes of the world, because America is and was, as articulated by Harry Truman, a republic, not an empire. We seek to create a rules-based society where individuals and nations can flourish according to the best of their ability. And that means being free from the specter of invasion by foreign nations. The speech kicked off the Cold War has been said and it has had some critics in the past and we will address those. But I think its vindication today in terms of its wisdom and its principles set out by President Truman could not be clearer. We have woken from, I think, the slumber of thinking perhaps it's the end of history. We realize we cannot take democracy for granted. We cannot take peace for granted. That indeed investing in peace is absolutely essential. Um, and it needs to be done from a position of strength, not weakness. And that's what Harry Truman stood for at the time. He gave the speech for in Congress, creating bipartisan support for a peacetime investment in standing up to tyranny and autocracy on behalf of democracies around the world. And it's sometimes I think some of the background of the Truman Doctrine uh, tends to get lost because it hinges upon a request for aid by Greece, which was current, which was then in the midst of a civil war uh, against communist aggression, precipitated by the fact that Britain, in the wake of the Second World War, given its own internal difficulties in building back, had to take a step back from its support of the free government of Greece. This is a little personal to me because my grandparents were Greek immigrants. Uh, incidentally, I will say that my grandfather, who uh, fought in the Second World War um, in the uh, in the Pacific Theater, uh, was never shy about saying that Harry Truman was his favorite president. Um, but it wasn't just because of this. Um, but it was notable that at a moment when the previous superpower uh, of Great Britain, our ally, needed to take a step back to mend its own house, that the United States stepped up. And it was notable the way that Harry Truman decided to do it as well. Um, in a very short period of time, from Great Britain's announcement and Greece's plea for assistance, it was decided that, pre, uh, that support would be given not only to Greece, but also to Turkey, its historic rival, and in a means of expanding uh, the balance of power in a way that was itself balanced. That Truman heard, made the case for the Truman Doctrine in its earliest forms with Dean Acheson and Secretary of State George Marshall and crucially, Republican Senate leader Arthur Vandenberg, head of the Senate Foreign Relations Committee, in an Oval Office meeting in late February, where Vandenberg understood the severity, a former isolationist himself who abandoned that position after the attack on Pearl Harbor, and who's perhaps best known for saying partisan politics ought to stop at the water's edge. He was conservative. He was an old school Midwestern Republican, but he was a strong supporter of Harry Truman, not only in the Truman Doctrine, but in the Marshall Plan. And he encouraged uh, President Truman to make a speech to Congress, making the case for why there needed to be aid to Greece and Turkey, even though the war had over, foregoing, in effect, a peace dividend, which many Americans understandably felt that they had earned. But Harry Truman was thinking bigger about American responsibilities. He was thinking bigger about the defense of democracy against any form of autocracy. And that was the context in which he finally gave his speech in front of Congress on March 12th, 1947. It's part of a larger effort, um, including the Marshall Plan, but it really was the kickoff in a call to defend the democracies of Greece and Turkey against the Soviet expansionism, bolstered by George Kennan's long telegram and uh, Mr. the article published in Foreign Affairs under the pseudonym Mr. X. But this was all part of a coordinated grand strategy uh, that the man from independence was not shy about embracing. And it's a great fortune to the United States, but also a tribute to the Truman administration that President Truman was surrounded by such giants of that post-war world, not only George Kennan and George Marshall, uh, Arthur Vandenberg, Dean Acheson, Clark Clifford, all these people who contributed enormously to a, a time of, of rising responsibility in, in the name of real idealism, but balanced by a realism, which I think characterizes the Truman Doctrine and President Truman's foreign policy that set a direction 
for the nation for really up until today, by and large. Um, the speech itself is, is worth recounting in great detail. And I've got a, a fondness for such things, not only because I've written a book about George Washington's farewell address, and uh, my most recent book focuses a great deal on Lincoln's second inaugural. Um, it was a moment of high drama. It was a serious speech, 18 minutes long, the first half of which was primarily concerning the specific circumstances that Greece and Turkey then found themselves in against the backdrop of Soviet expansionism. But the back half of the speech was a statement of principles, and they endure. And I thought I'd read just a little bit of the speech, some excerpts tonight, to give you a sense of the tone and the tenor and the flavor that made it so powerful uh, and so well received on both sides of the aisle. President Truman said, one of the primary objectives of the foreign policy of the United States is the creation of conditions in which we and other nations will be able to work out a way of life free from coercion. This was a fundamental issue in the war with Germany and Japan. Our victory was won over countries which sought to impose their will and their way of life on other nations. To ensure the peaceful development of nations free from coercion, the United States has taken a leading part in establishing the United Nations. The United Nations is designed to make possible lasting freedom and independence for all its members. We shall not realize our objectives, however, unless we are willing to help free people maintain their free institutions and their national integrity against aggressive movements that seek to impose upon them totalitarian regimes. This is no more than a frank recognition that totalitarian regimes imposed upon free peoples by direct or indirect aggression undermine the foundations of international peace and hence the security of the United States. At the present moment in world history, nearly every nation must choose between alternative ways of life. But the choice is too often not a free one. One, our, one way of life is best based upon the will of the majority and distinguished by free institutions, representative government, free elections, guarantees of individual liberty, freedom of speech and religion, and freedom from political oppression. Incidentally, that's as neat a description of the essence of liberal democracy as you'll find anywhere. The second way of life is based upon the will of a minority forcibly imposed upon the majority. It relies upon terror and oppression, a controlled press and radio, fixed elections, and the suppression of personal freedoms. I believe that it must be the policy of the United States to support free peoples who are resisting attempted subjugation by armed minorities or by outside pressures. I believe that we must assist free peoples to work out their own destinies in their own way. I believe that our help should be primarily through economic and financial aid, which is essential to economic stability and orderly political processes. The world is not static and the status quo is not sacred, but we cannot allow changes in the status quo in violation of the charter of the United Nations by such methods as coercion or by such subterfuges as political infiltration. In helping free and independent nations maintain their freedom, the United States will be giving effect to the principles of the charters of the United States. It would be an unspeakable tragedy if these countries, which have struggled so long against overwhelming odds, should lose that victory for which they sacrificed so much. Collapse of free institutions and loss of independence would be disastrous not only for them, but for the world. Discouragement and possibly failure would quickly be the lot of neighboring peoples striving to maintain their freedom and independence. This is a serious course upon which we embark. I would not recommend it, except that the alternative is much more serious. The United States contributed $341 million billion towards winning World War II. This is an investment in world freedom and world peace. The assistance I'm recommending for Greece and Turkey amounts to little more than one-tenth of one percent of this investment. It is only common sense that we should safeguard this investment and make sure it was not in vain. The seeds of totalitarian regime, regimes are nurtured by misery and want. They spread and grow in the evil soil of poverty and strife. They reach 
their full growth, when the hope of a people for a better life has died, we must keep that hope alive. The free peoples of the world look to us in support of maintaining their freedoms. If we falter in our leadership, we may endanger the peace of the world, and we shall surely endanger the welfare of our own nation. What strikes me in, in reading those words is not only their applicability to our own times and the fact that they're based upon principles that are, in fact, timeless, but the fact that it is not a declaration of Cold War. It is a defense of freedom and self-determination rooted in the ideals of liberal democracy. That Truman takes care to say that the primary means of securing these freedoms should not be military, but they should be through economic and financial aid perhaps a hat tip to the Marshall Plan that would fully realize this vision, announced just a few months after the fact. It is a speech that is little r Republican. It is not the speech of an empire. It's a reminder that the United States, even at that moment of primacy upon the global stage, had no interest in the expansion of empire, that it was instead devoting its period of maximum power to the preservation of a structure that would ensure the endurance of principles that would allow other nations to flourish as they saw fit. That there's no moral equivalence between autocracies or ideologies like communism that seek to expand through violence, fear, and intimidation their own agendas and impose it upon a will of the majority of people. That it's rooted in individual rights and therefore human rights and the creation of multilateral organizations from the United Nations, which he specifically cites, to other multilateral organizations that would emerge in the wake of this policy. It holds up. The principles holds up. The speech holds up. Its wisdom holds up. And the fact that it's very much grounded in practical reality, it balances idealism about the world we would like to see and the world as it is, idealism and realism. The arrows, and the olive branch that we see beneath the great seal of the United States. The speech was greeted with bipartisan applause, applause and bipartisan support. That doesn't mean there was not grousing from the far left and the far right who clung to notions of isolationism that were no longer applicable in that rapidly shrinking world or to a continued, I think, objectively naive view of Stalin's Soviet expansionism and that characteristic which the Soviet Union carried forward for much time. There were and are sober criticisms of the effects of this policy, particularly in domino theory. Some people in the essays I've been reading and preparing for this, written in the 1970s, went so far as to blame Vietnam for the repercussions of the speech because of the ideas of domino theory. But I think this is not a speech limited to containment, and it doesn't specifically reference domino theory. Instead, it is about the United States and multilateral organizations have an obligation to deter aggression, particularly when larger nations invade smaller ones, directly or indirectly. And that's a message that I think the United States has kept up its bargain toward. We are not perfect because perfect's never on the menu. At our best, we do remember that we are a republic, not an empire, but we are a republic of ideas that can rally the spirit of free peoples. When Saddam Hussein invaded Kuwait in the first Gulf War, President George H.W. Bush rallied the world in a spirit that I think directly draws on the inspiration of the Truman Doctrine, showing that indeed this was a bipartisan speech. Indeed, I think most of the bipartisan consensus during the Cold War draws on the Truman Doctrine showing that this is a foreign policy that puts partisan politics aside. Then in the words of Vanden, Arthur Vandenberg, partisan politics ought to stop at the water's edge. And I think the speech is ultimately complemented by the Marshall Plan, announced a few months later by Secretary Marshall. There's a wonderful story about um, President Truman being, having being suggested to him that perhaps it should be called the Truman Plan instead. And given that Republicans controlled both houses of Congress at that time, and that Truman's popularity was not, not what it might be, he said, now, if you put my name on that, on, send it up to Capitol Hill, it'll quiver a couple of times and die. Put your name on it, Secretary Marshall, General Marshall. Um, 
And in the deed, Truman and Marshall and Vandenberg, the Republican colleague, worked behind the scenes for months to ensure its passage, to ensure that there was bipartisan support, which does not mean unanimity, but that it was sold to the American people in a process of reasoning with them. Yes, with the specter of sovereign expansion, I think solidifying the right flank, but also because it was about America's role in the world and us living up to our highest ideals in an investment in peace, which is what the Marshall Plan was. An investment in peace, the opposite of reparations that made all the difference in pushing back Soviet expansionism and solidifying uh, the liberal democratic order, which was further secured by NATO and trade regimes that have stayed in place to this day. You know, I think we've learned in recent years that we cannot take our own democracy for granted, that we don't live in anything resembling an end of history, but that also we cannot take the relative peace and prosperity in Europe over the past 75 years for granted either. Many did. I think we all recognize now in the face of the invasion of Ukraine that taking anything for granted is unwise. And the need for the multilateral organizations that were created in large part by President Truman and our allies in the wake of the Second World War have shown themselves to be newly relevant. Indeed, I think they've been revived with a renewed sense of purpose in the face of this aggression. It's notable that even at the outset of his administration, there was a long article in the Atlantic Monthly I found about President Biden embracing and updating the Truman Plan, the Truman Doctrine. And that at heart, I think this administration's philosophy is rooted in the Truman Doctrine. We have much more divided times on Capitol Hill even than Harry Truman dealt with. There was no obvious Arthur Vandenberg, but I think the current faith in the power of multilateral organizations and in the decided economic counter offensive, that's something that perhaps Truman and his extraordinary band of compatriots and his administration on Capitol Hill during his time could not have imagined. But in some ways, if you read the doctrine, if you read the speech of the Truman Doctrine, you'll see that it's a continuation. It's using economic aid, but also economic sanctions to push back on aggression, short of military confrontation, because it's not simply containment that is the goal. It's the preservation of peace and freedom and self-determination. It's the idea that there's no moral equivalence between democracy and autocracy at the end of the day, even as we strive to find something like coexistence. But that coexistence must be peaceful and respect boundaries and respect self-determination, the rule of law and human rights. So 75 years after Harry Truman announced the Truman Doctrine, I think it's an irony of history that we see that its message, that its wisdom and its principles are more relevant than ever. The Truman Doctrine remains a proud moment in the United States and the trajectory it set us on and I think the ripples of hope, as well as determination it's set forward, carry forward to this day with renewed urgency and principle in the pursuit of peace.